everyone, we are team completed, consisting of Raynet, Justin, Palin, and Chirapti. So quick introduction to ourselves. We are from Raffles Institution and we are representing our school's robotics club in the Rescue Line U19 category. It's been a six month long journey. You can see a picture of our robot at the bottom right and a picture of our team at the bottom left. So a quick overview of the film. We'll be breaking down the ta we'll be breaking down the map into ta into different tasks. Uh, and we'll be starting off with the line track and green squares, followed by the rescue kit, then obstacle avoidance, and lastly the evacuation zone. So for line tracking, we're using a seven sensor line array mounted on a 3D print between the two front wheels. The 3D print is calculated such that it doesn't hit the bumps or the bottom of the ramp. And it's also located at the ideal height above the line so that the light array can return accurate readings. The light array is also mounted as far in front as possible to make line tracking more efficient. We are also using omnibus for our back wheels, which are basically wheels with small rollers around the circumference that are perpendicular to the turning motion of the wheel itself. So what this does is reduce the side friction, which will allow for more efficient line tracking. For green squares, we are using two color sensors that are mounted right behind the light array using Stanos. So this location is such that the light array can check for a junction first before the color sensors check for green. The distance between the two sensors also account for the maximum width of the light. As for software, PID control is used for line tracking. The error value is calculated via the symmetry of the values from the light array. As the line strays further from the center of the light array, the error value also increases proportionally. Firstly, the proportional gain was adjusted such that the robot was able to follow the line. Next, we added a derivative term which is calculated by subtracting the previous error from the current one. When the derivative term was added, it reduced the large oscillations of the robot about the line. Lastly, since steady state error was insignificant, we decided to omit the integral term. During testing, we encountered a problem where the error value may be lower than expected when the black line lies only on the rightmost or leftmost sensor. To solve this, when the line is only on the rightmost or leftmost sensor, we set the error to a maximum. This maximum error value is calculated as the robot progresses along the track. In order to distinguish colors for the green squares, we would need to separate color components from intensity. The data from the color sensors uses an RGB color space, which is converted to a HSV color space as converting to HSV is fast and easily implemented. The bounds of hue, saturation, and value for green were then determined during testing in order to distinguish white from green along the line of the track. To combine the logic of line tracking, green square detection, 90 degree and 180 degree turns. A state machine design was chosen and implemented as it would be easier to reason about and the number of states of the robot are limited. Additionally, this design would be able to be expanded and scaled up easily, which would be useful in the implementation of rescue kit and obstacle avoidance.
Second will be detected using an LDR and an LED. The LDR and the LED are mounted on three prints that are extruded from the front of the robot. So it's an extension of the same 3D print that mounts the light array. So how the LDR and the LED works is that when they're mounted opposite each other across the width of the robot, they form a light gate. So how the light gate works is that the LDR returns consistent values while the robot is uh, maneuvering through the map. However, when the rescue kit intercepts this light gate, the LDR value falls, which prompts the rescue kit maneuver. So the LED is connected to a resistor which is hidden by tape and the extrusion from the front doesn't hit the ramp. For the software portion of Rescue Kit, we found during testing that LDR readings were drastically different at different light conditions. Thus, we added a calibration sequence to the start to find the maximum reading and a minimum reading with and without the Rescue Kit. Subsequent readings were then scaled to that range from 0 to 1. This ensured more consistency in the detection of rescue kit with varying light conditions. We then added the pickup state and a transition to set state to the state machine from the line tracking state. So for obstacle avoidance, we are using time of flight sensors. So how TOF sensors work is that they emit a signal and based on the time difference between the emitter signal and the reflected signal, the TOF sensor is then able to detect the distance between the sensor and the object. So we have two TOF sensors, one is located at the front and the other is located at the right side of the robot. So the front TOF is able to detect the obstacle and it's located at a height such that the rescue kit or the ramp will not trigger a false positive. The site TOF is then used to track around the obstacle. For the software portion of obstacle avoidance, a new pickup state and transition to set state was added to the state machine from the line tracking state. When an object is detected about 10 cm away, it turns anti-clockwise until the site TOF, which is on the right of the robot, detects the object. It loops around the object, maintaining a distance of about 10 cm, and stops and returns back to line tracking when a black line is detected. The ramp and the bumps, the center of gravity of the robot is also very low, as the battery is secured underneath the robot using Velcro strips. This allows for the robot to not topple when climbing up the ramp. None of the confidence of the robots underneath or in front of the robot also hit the bump or the ramp before the front wheels do, which ensures that there's uh, no strain or any damage. For the evacuation zone, we're using a 3D printer claw. For a more optimal design, we're using a right claw that has two pincers, or the left claw has a pincer in the middle, such that uh, both the claws are able to overlap, and the object doesn't pop out when the claw closes as well. We're using splicing tape around each claw, which is kind of like a rubber tape, and it increases the friction so that the object won't slip out when, the, when it's being carried to the storage compartment. The claw is connected to the board by a 3D printer connector, so this connector is very important and it mounts the two clutch servos that control the claw itself. It also mounts a color sensor, which is able to detect the color of the object because we needed to differentiate the life and dead victims. So if you notice in the picture, there's also a protrusion in front of the color sensor. So this is to prevent the collision, uh, to prevent the collision of the sensor with the object, because this may uh, affect readings. So the connector itself connects to a 2kg clutch servo on the robot that moves the entire clock mechanism. So for the next part of the evacuation zone would be the storage compartments. So the frame itself for the storage compartments are made of corrugated cardboard because it's light and convenient. 
and the entire frame is held up by standoffs to the robot. Each cardboard wall is also held up by 3D printed L brackets. The front height of the storage compartment syncs with the max height of the claw so that the ball will uh, roll into the compartment and it's large enough for the two separate compartments that we need for the live and dead victims. So to separate them into two compartments, we need a 3D printed barrier also. So this 3D printed barrier firstly houses a clutch servo, which is what we need for the dispensing mechanism. So at neutral stance, this uh, clutch servo blocks both the compartments. The barrier also obviously acts as a barrier between the two compartments. So the length of the barrier doesn't cover the whole of the storage compartment because the claw needs to assist the barrier in, uh, in, the, sorting, uh, in the sorting mechanism, which will be explained later in the software part. So the length of the barrier itself is 9 cm and each compartment can hold up to two objects because we know that the ping pong ball is 40 millimeters in diameter. For the software portion of the evacuation zone, to detect the difference between the alive and dead victims, the bounds of hue, saturation and value for white and orange were determined through testing to distinguish the orange and white balls using the color sensor mounted on the claw. To sort the balls, after the claw is raised into the compartment area and the color is detected, the claws are used to sort the ball into the compartments for the alive and dead victims. By turning only one of the claws, we can choose which slot the ball will roll into without a separate sorting system. The evacuation zone would be swept in a zigzag motion. The location of the deposit point would be determined during the sweeping. The robot knows when it has detected the deposit point when the front TOF sensor detects an object since its mounting height ensures that the ball does not trigger a false positive. When the robot finishes the sweep, it drives to the predetermined location of the deposit point and deposits the box. Another sweeping motion is used around the evacuation zone to find the red or green exit points to leave the evacuation zone. Another state machine was created to handle the logic of the evacuation zone as the main state machine had grown too complex. So for the main wiring of the robot, the LiPo battery is connected to the 6 volt regulator and the 5 volt regulator. The 6 volt regulator is, powers the clutch servos through the 6 volt servo rail on the protobot and powers the driving motors through the motor driver. The 5 volt regulator powers the sensors we have been using like the light array, the color sensors through the 5 volt sensor rail, which is also on the protobot. And it also powers the Arduino Mega, which means that we don't need a separate source to power the Mega. So the two voltage regulators mentioned are different in sizes, so they've been mounted differently as well. The 6 volt regulator is mounted on a 3D print at the back of the robot, and the 5 volt regulator, which is rather small, is simply taped up, uh, such that it doesn't short with any metal. So the Mega, the motor driver, and the protobot are all very important parts of the robot. The motor driver is a shield which maps onto the Mega pins, so this means that it can be stacked on top of the Mega. So the protobot that has separate power rails for the servos and the sensors is uh, similar to the motor driver as well. We simply put pin headers below the protobot and we stacked it on top of the motor driver as well. Despite mounting, software setup and calibration of the inertial measurement unit, we were unable to get it to return proper readings near the end of the development. Hence, we were not able to use the IMU in the implementation. Thus. In the future, we hope to be able to fix and use the IMU for increased precision of turns. As for our roles, we have Shrapti, who is our team captain, and Justin, responsible for hardware, while Palin and I, Raynard, are responsible for the software. Thank you for your time and attention.